All right, Jake, what is your fifth and final tip for us, please? Uh, right, fifth and final tip is to give students worked examples with their retrieval starters. Oh, right. This sounds a bit controversial. I like it, right? T tell me exactly what this looks like <laughs> and why you do it. Uh, I should have printed one off. That's my... Oh, here we go. This is sort of one oh, this is good. on the board over oh. here. Um, so... I do this, so you, the students basically get four four questions. Here you go. These these are ones that I've answered yeah. myself. Uh, I guess people listening can't can't hear it. And then next to that, they've got four similar questions with worked examples on them as well. So all kind of hand drawn solutions to these to similar questions, not the the same numbers. So it's different numbers, right? Um, and they have it printed. So it's printed off four per page. So it's going to save a bit of paper as they come into the room. They've got on their desk six questions to do in a grid. But if they're stuck on any of those questions, they can turn over that piece of paper and they've got work solutions to similar questions, but not the same ones on the back. That is good. That is good. And this, this, right. this comes from my year 10 class uh, last year because we had to give them Corbett Maths 5 a day, which, which is brilliant. I think it's brilliant in many different ways, especially for those students who are in the top sets. But when you've got a class and their confidence is generally quite low, it's sort of that you know foundation class somewhere at the bottom in your in, in your year group, and they see they see that grid, and it's too hard, and they they there's no way in right. They're looking at those questions, they can't do them, just getting demoralised, and you're starting this lesson with students who think they can't do maths, and I just don't think that's fair. I think we're setting them up to fail if we're doing that. If we're giving them questions, which I guess I, you know, I guess there we should be giving them questions which are which are slightly easier, but then they're not going to get that harder content as well. So. I want to give them questions at the at the level that I want them to be working at, but if they can't do them, they can just turn that over and they've got some work solutions to help them. So it also reduces, you know, at the beginning of the lesson, you're doing the register, you're trying to deal with maybe some behavior issues in the room and, and other things going on, you know, bring up your PowerPoint, whatever else it might be. So you want the students to be able to help themselves as much as possible. And that's a big thing for me. I think, I think you're a big believer in giving students answers to worksheets, is that right as well? Yeah, yes, so it's, it's a similar thing here, except it's not the answer. It's, it's a work solution that's going to help them with those with those questions. Jake, that is flipping. You, you've you've saved one of the best ones to last year. That, that's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. That. I've, I'm I'm a bit obsessed with with do nows and, and starters. One of the key things for a do now to be effective is that the kids have got to be able to get on with it independently. And yeah. you're absolutely right. You see a lot of students, even though maybe you you know you've pitched it at the right level for whatever reason they can't access one of the questions they just sit there doing nothing or they're asking you and then you can't get on with whatever it is you need to do so i really like the idea of giving them help but not giving them it visible so they have to turn it over i think that's mm -hmm. really powerful and the fact you're not giving them the answer you're still making them do a bit of work with the with the uh, with the related work for example i think that's really powerful so a few yeah. questions with you are for you on this one um, how long's that taken to, to to put together like one of these the the, the grid of six and, and yeah yeah um, yeah so I have solutions is that so I've, I've put about seventy two different um, different skills together so far now I want to have done a lot more but I find it very hard to motivate myself to do this but I've got seventy two different skills each one has four days worth of the same questions so the idea is that the students are going to do the same question four days in a row except different numbers, right? But they're, they're getting to know that skill. So they're really mastering it by the end of like a week's worth of lessons. Um, it takes me about 15 minutes roughly to do each of these skills, but it's hard to motivate myself to do that. But once I've made them, I put them on my website and then anyone can use them. So that, that's the important part. For you to use them, it's gonna take you about like 20 seconds to put together one of these grids from my website. Jeez, okay. Um, next question, How? and this, this, a, this is an awkward one, this Jake. How are you choosing what skills to assess the students or to get them to retrieve? What's your, what's your strategy there? Um, so I'd like it to be very scientific, but with only 72 <laughs> that I've made so far, it's yeah, which ones haven't they done yet that we've already covered in the scheme of learning or that I could kind of pre-teach them on a little bit here. Um, so I try and vary it around a bit. So all, all this stuff is on my website at mathsuniverse.com slash skills. And I've got various different ways I'm gonna extend this in the future as well. Um, but th there's a way to basically um, locally save without having to log in which skills you've given the students before. So you kind of create a class, you know, year eight, X2, whatever it might be. You set six different skills for them and it's kind of a drag and drop interface. You are choosing which skills to have 
for that week. And, and then when it comes to the next week, it will kind of gray out the ones you've already done the previous week. So you don't do those ones again. Um, but I'm creating them at the moment kind of based on the scheme of learning in my current school. So, you know, I've kind of got things based on that. But the idea is to be able to create different schemes of learning from that in the future as well. And yeah, have it in some sort of intelligent way so that there's some spacing between different topics during the year or during the whole curriculum in a school. Flipping heck, flipping heck. Right, well, um, final couple of questions on this. So I really like the idea that, as I've just said, the kids can, they have no excuse. They can crack on with stuff and if they're stuck, they can turn the page over and, and have a look for, for the worked example. Once the kids have, you know, spent five, ten minutes or whatever on this, what are you doing then? Are you just projecting answers up? How are you checking yep. for understanding? What, what, how do you wrap that process up? Yeah, so I've changed the process a bit since I started making these about a year and a half ago. So the, the current process is I will have my PowerPoint slide. In that slide, there will be a link um, to these six questions. So these six questions, they're just saved in a link, basically. It just saves what codes uh, are these questions. The next slide will be the six questions themselves. That's what's going to be on the board as the, as the students come on the room, in the room. And that's going to be on the front side of their sheet in front of them. And then the next slide is going to be the solutions to those, which is... Um, it's not the ones on the back of the sheet, is it? Because that's solutions to the previous day's questions, basically. But um, So I've got, I've got my PowerPoint all set up in that way. And before the lessons, so I've chosen my six questions. I then click on that link and then hit print. And it automatically prints it four per page, uh, double-sided, say, say paper, which is always nice. And the students come into the room and they've got around about four or five minutes to work on those questions in silence. So, and like I say, that is really silent. I'm not going around and telling them or you're doing really well there. Um, none of that even, just really, really is in silence. After those five minutes, I've done the register as well. If I've had to like read out their names there, I say to them and uh, talking in your pairs. And then they are discussing each, with each other. They're going over their answers to see if they've got the same answer as each other, to see if they can help each other at all. So there is that, that period of silence and then they've got that time to talk through the answers together. And then maybe a minute into that, 30 seconds, two minutes, depending on how they're getting on. I'm going to go and project the answers on the board. I don't even tell them I've projected them on. And then 30 seconds later, I tell them the answer up on the board. They can check them. Um, sometimes we might discuss some of the questions. Oh, the other thing I do is I write down all six answers on a little bit of paper before the lesson or in like the first 30 seconds of the lesson. And then I just go around the room with that little piece of paper. And all I'm saying to the students is, no, that's wrong. No, try that one again. I'm not really giving them much more guide than that. If it feels like they need a bit more guide, it will just be have a look at the back. Like have a look at the work solution, try and figure out for yourself. There's a lot, lot, lot to unpack there. Um, I, for a start, that simple piece of paper having the answers on, that's a, that's a game changer, right? Having that, like I, I see so many lessons these days and I've been guilty of this myself, where you wander around the room, you look at an answer, you don't have a bloody clue whether it's right or wrong. So you haven't worked yeah. it out yourself. <laughs> Whereas if it's on, a, or, you, or you've worked it out, but you can't remember what the answer is because it's on your yeah. desk or it's at home or whatever. And if you just and that, that, that's something I've only time. started doing in the last couple of weeks. I'm like, I, I, I just got this like pile of bits of paper, like this size. I just do a quick grid and I copy down from a slide. Like I freeze one of the one of the things on the board for them to see. I, I write down the six answers and I'm just looking if they've got those right or not, basically. And I'm just saying, no, that's wrong. Um, I'm not giving them ticks as I go around because that's going to take too long. They just generally assume if I've been over their shoulder and I've seen their work, it's, it's correct unless I've told them it's unless I told them it's wrong. I really like that. And the other thing, uh, of course, I'm looking for, I'm looking for problems as well, right? I'm looking for misconceptions. I'm looking for common mistakes. I might, if lots of people are making the same mistake, I might say something like the answer to question one isn't twelve, um, or I might say don't yeah. you know, don't forget your units. I'm fed up of kids not putting their units on. Like they've done it math, like they've got the quantity right, but they just haven't put centimetre squared or whatever on the end. So um, I might give them a few little hints like that. And then if there is something I haven't mentioned during that largely period of silence, then before I put the solutions up, I might say, okay, question three, you know, lots of us have got this wrong. Let's go over this one together. Got it, got it. And what, there's a couple of final things I really love about this. I'm a massive fan of the combination of letting kids work on their own first, but then before yeah. answers come up, letting them have a moment to discuss with the person next to them because it solves so many problems in a really efficient way. It stops you having to have the same conversation with loads of different students. I love that. And the final thing I absolutely love is that you're not then live going through, this is how you do question one, watch me everybody, or how do you do one, or how do you do one, blah, blah, blah. It's all the answers are on the board, 
the kids can mark and then you can then deal with any problems versus yeah. you know the child who's who's got one two three four and five right and he's waiting for you to help on six they've got to sit and watch you go through every single mm -hmm. thing whereas the answers are on the board the kids can focus on the exact thing that they need to focus on. I'm a big advocate of that. That feels like a powerful That's right. And again, it's, it's not just the answer on the board. It is a work solution answer yes. to that question. So if they, if they don't understand how the number got there, they can hopefully follow through as they're sticking it into their book or whatever. Um, yeah, how to get to that answer. And then that's the, then going to be the work solution that's on the back of the next day's sheet, which is going to have similar questions on. Clever. That is clever. Yeah, I'm going to need to rethink do now. I, I, I love that. I never thought to combine the do now with the related work example. That is that is good. So the fifth and final tip was about giving students worked examples with their retrieval starters. And if you go to mathsuniverse.com slash skills or click on the skills grid creator on the homepage, you get to the tool that I've been making to help you with that. Um, now, there are 72 different skills that I've made so far, but I will be adding more skills in the future as well. We can start off just going for a random selection of those. So if I click random, it's going to uh, choose six of those 72 at random. You'll notice it highlights the ones currently selected. Uh, if I wanted to, I could go on one of those and I could choose uh, a different uh, skill instead. Uh, we can also reset it and we can manually check, uh, select different skills either by dragging them in or by clicking them on the left. If we want to put a skill in a particular place, we just click on that slot and we can also drag and drop these skills around the place. Um, I'm going to go for a random one. Uh, oh, we've also got a, a search feature, so I could search, for example, for the word fraction. And then we've got a list of uh, skills to do with fractions. And then again, we can drag those into the right places. So I create four different days of each skill. In fact, I create a fifth day as well, day zero. I'll come to that in just a moment. And as we go from one to the next, the numbers change, but not, not else much really changes about them. And what we get is we get the questions, here are the six questions, and then we get the work solutions to those six questions. So these are gonna be answers that we're gonna show on the board afterwards. We also get work solutions to the previous day's questions. So when it comes to printing out a copy of the questions for the kids to work on, on one side, they're gonna have the six questions they're gonna be doing, and on the reverse side, they're gonna get six similar questions with the answers, in fact, the work solutions on those questions. So if they're stuck at all, they can go and have a look at those. So let's go and reset that. Again, we can choose choose questions just by dragging them in. You could choose which day you're doing as well. We've also got different classes that you can set up. So um, with my 8x2 class, you'll see that I've done at least eight weeks worth of questions with them. If I wanna go and see what I did in week one, week two, week three, I can go and have a look at the history I've done with them. Now that's just storing that locally in the browser. So that's not kind of syncing it between devices or or on the web or anything like that, that at all. In fact, everything is stored in the web address. So that web address is unique and it shows these six skills and that web address really helps you, that URL really helps you when it comes to printing them off at school as I'll show you in just a moment. Now with 8x2, um, because I've got um, a copy uh, kind of stored on the computer, what skills we've done in the, in the past, when it comes to creating a new week's worth of work for them, let's just reset that and now we're doing a ninth week. I can see grayed out all of those skills that I've used in the past. So I'm going to just select for the next week skills that they haven't done uh, in the past. Uh, or maybe there is one I want them to do again, right? So maybe they, they struggled on um, highest common factor, so I can put that highest common factor in. Now that web address, okay, so that web address which I've taken here, if I go and make a new window and go to that same web address, it doesn't matter what computer I'm on, that web address stores which skills we're using, which six skills, also which day of the week. Um, so that web address really is unique for those six skills and the day's worth of skills that we're looking at. Now, the reason that is so important is I'm going to be preparing my lessons at home. So when I'm preparing my lesson and the starter to go in it, I'll choose the six questions. I'll then go and paste the web address that is unique to those six questions and the day that we're on. And then very quickly, I'm going to press copy on the questions themselves. And I'm going to go to a new slide and I'm going to copy the answers. So that's my PowerPoint prepared for that lesson. I've got the link, which will help me print those questions off. I've got the questions. And then once they finish the questions, I might go over them one by one, or I might just go and put those answers straight up on the board. Now, because I've got that link, when I get to school after preparing my lesson at home, I'm gonna take that link, I'm gonna paste it into a web browser, and all I'm gonna do is hit that print button. 
Now that's going to print really efficiently on your piece of paper. It's going to print four copies of that starter grid, double-sided, with the questions on one side and the work solutions to similar questions on the other. So all I really need to think here is how many students do I have in my class? Let's say 32. Divide that number by four, and I'm going to print off eight copies of that sheet. So that is how you can use mathsuniverse.com skills to give students worked examples with their retrieval starters. Thank you.